Hey everyone, today we are going to be talking about AOIP or audio over IP. Maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't. Hopefully either way, this video will give you some new information on the stuff that is powering our new broadcast studios. Before we get started, I just want to mention that I have not been paid or contacted by any manufacturer I talk about in this video to actually talk about their products. I've picked products that I was familiar with, or maybe I thought you were familiar with, or maybe just interested in. Welcome back to Bartos Media, I'm Eric, and today, like I said, we'll be covering all things AOIP or audio over IP. We'll cover everything from the basics of the protocols to how they're implemented, and yet somehow all different, but still a little bit the same. So let's dive into it. Starting with the basics, in front of me, I have a selection of audio over IP interfaces. Basically, these are just like your standard USB audio interfaces, but rather than getting audio in and out of your computer, they allow you to get audio in and out of the network. Yeah, the, the network, because everything on uh, AOIP is just running on a network. And we'll talk more about the specifics of the network in another video, but in a bit we'll talk about the basics that you need to get up and running with your audio over IP system. So no matter the brand of AOIP system, there are essentially two things that are required to make audio over IP what it is. And that's an RTP stream and a master clocking source. RTP stands for Real-Time Transport Protocol, and basically it's how the audio data is actually transmitted over the network. The RTP protocol has been around since 1996 as RFC 1889, and really has been proven to be a super reliable form of transporting audio over the network via TCP, UDP, multicast, or unicast. In 2003, the original RFC specification was superseded by RFC 3550, where no real changes were made to the protocol and the specification, but it allowed for the enhancement of the scalable timer algorithm, calculating when to send packets when many participants are joining an RTP stream simultaneously. Since I don't want to spend the next year reading the specification document on camera for you guys, I'll have it linked down in the description, so if you have some time for a little bit of light reading, you can take a look at that lovely 104-page document detailing every little bit of the protocol. However, just because all AOIP vendors use RTP as the basis of their protocol does not mean they are all interchangeable. There are many different ways to implement the RTP protocol in an AOIP system, most notably TCP versus UDP, and the use of different audio codecs to encode the audio that we're sending into the network as the RTP stream. That codec, along with the clocking mechanism, is what distinguishes all the different AOIP brands from each other, except for AES67. And we'll touch on that one in just a little bit. All right, let's talk about clocks. No, not that kind of clock. If you've ever walked into a recording studio, you may have heard of a word clock. Not world clock, word clock. These were used and still are very widely used to keep all digital studio equipment in sync. In an AOIP network, we also need a clocking source to keep all that audio that we're spewing into the network in the right order when we go to decode it on the other side of that network switch. All manufacturers of AOIP equipment do have their own proprietary clocking system. However, most newer versions of these protocols support syncing to Precision Time Protocol, or PTP. PTP is a network protocol developed by IEEE, which allows devices to synchronize together to a single master clock. In an ideal configuration, this allows for sub-millisecond time agreement between these devices. And if you're interested in some more light reading, IEEE 1588-2002 and IEEE 1588-2008 are both linked below. These are for versions 1 and 2 of PTP, respectively. Now, before we dive more into the specifics of AOIP, I wanted to take some time to talk about the basics of networking. Since networking deserves its own video, we'll just scratch the surface of what's needed to set up your AOIP network. The most important thing you're going to need for your network is a solid managed network switch. And in front of me here, I have two examples of managed switches. One that I'm currently testing from Fortinet, and it's proving to work very well with audio over IP, but it's not as full featured as the one below it here, which is from Cisco. And that one has been proven to work with AOIP networks since basically the beginning of time. 
Now, I've seen people using the cheap unmanaged network switches that you might use in your home or your office or your small business or whatever. Now, these may work, but they won't work. Essentially, with managed switches, you can prioritize the audio traffic on your network. And as a bonus, you can actually use a, a, a pr protocol called VLANs, and you can run more than one network on these switches. Uh, and as a bonus, since they're made for business and enterprise applications, they will provide wonderful customer support if you're buying these new, and they will have enough bandwidth on the back plane to support even the most demanding audio stream applications and other networks on top of that. Since your audio is relying on these network switches, I highly recommend taking the time to learn how they work and talk with the manufacturers of the AOIP equipment to get a solid recommendation on what type of switch you may need for your application or the protocol that you're choosing. There are other parts of the network that will make your life easier, like adding in a layer three switch or maybe a router or a firewall, but those really aren't usually necessary to get up and running with your standard audio over IP systems. And now that we've gotten the basics out of the way, let's dive into the different protocols. While I'd love to talk about every single protocol out there, I think it's really important to focus on just a few examples, starting with Dante. If you've ever done any live sound or probably even heard anyone talking about audio over IP, I'm sure you've heard someone mention Dante. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that Dante was the first mainstream audio over IP protocol. And by that, I mean it was the first one that really started to break out of one little niche market and spread across many different industries. While Dante itself is a closed protocol, meaning that you have to license its use, many manufacturers have been integrating Dante into their product line. And because of this, you won't be locked into one vendor if you go with Dante as your audio protocol. In addition to the closed portion of the protocol, Dante is compatible with AS67, meaning that you can send and receive audio to any device that supports AS67 on your network. The best example that I can think of off the top of my head would be mixing Dante with the Livewire Plus protocol from the Telos Alliance, since Livewire can also talk to AS67. One thing to note, however, that Dante is compatible with AS67 and not compliant with AS67. By now, you're probably wondering what AS67 is and why I specified compliant versus compatible when talking about interfacing Dante with AS67. Well, in short, AS67 is a standard for audio over IP and audio over ethernet interoperability developed by the Audio Engineering Society. It is based on existing standards to allow interoperability between these layer two and layer three audio protocols. On the technical side, AS67 specifies sample rates from 44.1 kilohertz per second up to 96 kilohertz per second at 16 or 24 bit depth with a maximum of 120 channels per device. AES67 is really an interesting standard to me, mostly because it lists standards for audio delivery, and that's pretty much it. There are uh, protocols suggested for discovery and different unicast connection management systems. However, they aren't required. And because of this, there are compatible devices and compliant devices. And just like any other specification, there are required parts and optional components. To be fully compliant, you must implement everything, even the optional parts of the specification in your product. However, because the goal is interoperability, you can have compatible devices and protocols. And while they won't be as nice to use as a compliant protocol, you will still be able to send audio from any AS67 to any other AS67 device on your network. And Dante is the perfect example of a compatible product. The biggest reason it is not compliant is the audio clocking mechanism. You can't turn off the Dante clock when you plug it into an AES67 network, and it's based on the PTPv1 protocol when AES67 specifies PTPv2 for their clocking. And in some instances, it doesn't even allow for the full range of sample rates or bit depths listed in the AES67 specifications. Even though Dante is only compatible with AS67, it still shows the value of a standard that will allow many different vendors and manufacturers to create devices that can talk to each other. 
And in fact, there are far too many vendors and devices that are AS67 compatible or compliant to even start to list in this video. It is also worth mentioning that AS67 is defined in SMPTE 2110 as the audio transport protocol. We'll have a whole other video on SMPTE 2110 someday, but for now, all you really need to know is that it's a suite of standards from the Society of Motion Picture and TV Engineers that describe how to send digital media over an IP network. The next protocol I'd like to talk a little bit about is Livewire. Livewire is developed by Axia Audio, a division of the Telos Alliance, and its initial release was in 2003, and it has since been superseded by a second release called Livewire Plus. This update added the compatibility with Ravana and full compliance with AES67. One thing to note is that generally everyone still just calls it Livewire and not Livewire Plus, and it's kind of implied that we're talking about the Plus version with full AES67 support, not the original version of Livewire that did not include AES67 support. Now, Livewire was designed with the broadcast studio in mind. And because of this, there are many nice features embedded into the protocol, like GPIO signaling, source advertisement, and control and routing protocols called Livewire Routing Protocol, or LWRP. The benefit of using Livewire rather than a pure AES67 implementation is really the addition of those control and signaling features. AES67 does not provide a way to toggle an on-air light or remote start a CD player. Livewire, on the other hand, has that built right into the protocol, thus eliminating the need for separate systems or dedicated hardware for GPIO signaling or audio routing. And speaking of audio routing, let's talk about the network side of Livewire. Livewire by default is a multicast protocol, unlike Dante that is by default a unicast protocol. What this means is that Dante will have individual audio streams for each device you connect to the network. For example, if you have a microphone plugged into a RDL microphone audio interface, and you have a speaker that is set up to listen to the microphone, and maybe a headphone amp that is Dante compatible listening to this uh, microphone, there will be one audio stream per device that is listening. So in that example, there would be two audio streams. On the other hand, Livewire has one audio stream per audio channel, and this stream is sent out to every single device on the network with multicast. But only the devices that are actually subscribed to that specific channel number or are listening to that specific IP address will actually be able to receive and listen to that audio. And notice that I also said by default. Both protocols can be run in either multicast or unicast mode. There are just a few settings to change and you're good to go. In fact, when you're configuring Dante for AES67 compatibility, you're actually just creating a multicast version of the Dante audio stream called a multicast flow. Running Livewire in unicast mode, however, changes the fundamental operation of the routing protocol, and it's really only recommended in situations where your network does not have the bandwidth required to support every single multicast stream. For example, in STL applications where wireless link bandwidth might be at a premium, you can run Livewire in unicast mode to get your audio over that link. And the final component of Livewire is the clocking mechanism. And this is really probably the most important part of the Livewire protocol. Livewire has its own clocking source, but due to its AS67 compliance, you can sync your entire Livewire plant to a PTPv2 master clock. If you don't have a PTP master clock, you can generate the proper AS67 PTP clock stream right from the Livewire Xnode devices. However, I would recommend investing in a solid master clock device for your studio to generate this PTP. Now, there are many reasons for a solid GPS locked master clock outside of audio over IP, so that is why I would recommend going that route. There is one final component to audio over IP networks that I have not mentioned yet, and that is the software component. Almost every audio over IP system has a, a, quite a large software component that goes along with it. And the biggest part of the software component is an audio driver. You can install this audio driver on any computer that supports the driver, and it allows you to receive digital audio directly into and out of the network without having to purchase special high-quality audio hardware to convert 
your audio from your computer to digital or to analog back into digital or digital back into analog. It's all done on the network. <laughs> Now before we wrap up, I do want to mention that digital audio and audio over IP is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Each protocol has their own little issues that might not make it the best solution for your use case. And if you're in the market for a digital audio or audio over IP solution, I encourage you to shop around and try out some different equipment to make sure you pick the solution that will fit your needs and your budget. And with all technology, things are always changing, and I can't guarantee you that everything I've talked about in this video will remain true for even the next year. However, I will do my best to publish some videos with updated information if things do change. Just be aware that it is very possible that things can change. Finally, as much as I want to push using audio over IP in every instance that's possible, I understand that that might not always be possible from a budget standpoint, or maybe even a logistical standpoint, to rip out an existing system and replace it with audio over IP, or even install audio over IP in a new build if the resources to maintain such a system do not exist in your environment. So there you have it. That's AOIP in a nutshell. I plan to do a few more videos going more in depth on some of the topics that I've touched on today in the coming months. For now, I hope this video helped you understand some of the basics of the new digital world we live in. And hopefully if you've used audio over IP, maybe you learned a little bit about how the protocols actually work. That's all I have for now. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell down there so you don't miss any of my new videos. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.